Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What an absolute delight and honor it is to be gathered with God's people uh, virtually. Those of you who are in the house, what a good moment it is for us to be able to fellowship together. Uh, I think Chris said it best when he first got up here. We, I have no clue where you guys are or what you're doing. I saw some of you in the chat room are driving and some of you are still in bed and some of you are up. You've showered, you've made the breakfast and you are sitting with your Bible open and you are ready for the word of God. and You are ready for worship today. Uh, the beautiful thing about uh, being virtual is it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. You're able to tap into worship and tap into the word of God. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm just grateful that we serve a God that we don't have to make an appointment in order to worship him. I'm glad that we serve a God that we don't have to make an appointment to get to the throne of grace. But Hebrew says you can come boldly before the throne of grace and find mercy in the time of need. And if we ever needed it, the time is certainly uh, now. Why don't you do me a favor and just share this link. If you're on Facebook, share it on Facebook. If you are uh, on YouTube, if you can copy the link and then send it to a friend, send it to a family member, send it to that one a ghetto friend that you have that you've just been praying that they would come to the Lord. Go ahead and send it to them. Don't even tell them why you did it. Just just say, here, here's some stuff that I want you to check out today as we dig into the word of God. And today's a great day. If you're piped on, if you're logged on today, it is a good day because we are starting a brand new four-week sermon series called Built Different. And by Built Different, we mean that as believers, we, we just go through life differently. We, we engage with things that the world engages with, but we just do it different. We do it with an anchor. We do it with hope. We do it um, um, optimistic that God is with us, dependent on what God is doing in our life. We respond to the pandemic differently is what we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks. We, we don't only respond to the pandemic differently, but social justice issues, we respond and engage them differently as believers. We're going to be talking about that in one of our weeks. Cultural changes, all of the fast-paced changes around us. We're going to be talking about that over the next four weeks. And how to deal with pain and loss. As believers, I just believe that we don't mourn the same way the, mor the, the world mourns. We, we don't grieve the same way the world grieves, but we do so differently and we do so with hope. In fact, that's what we're talking about today. Grab your Bibles, your devices. Do me a favor, run to Luke chapter... 23 Luke is found in the New Testament. It's the third book of the New Testament, the book of Luke. Once you're there, go to chapter 23. As you turn there, uh, man, we had a great time last week. Got to engage with people and meet some new faces and people that have been uh, members of the church, joined the church over the last year and got to engage and, 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 and connect and watch people serve. You know, serving is such a, the benefit of serving is always community. You, you get to be around the body. You get to be around brothers and sisters and like-minded folk who all have a common goal of pursuing Jesus and looking more like Jesus. And our ability to be able to gather has been hindered over the pandemic, but I am grateful that last week we got together. Stay tuned. Next month, we have a date. We haven't shared it with you yet. We just have to confirm a few more things, but we do have another date on the calendar. Our hope is to try to gather at least uh, once a month while we're moving toward weekly gatherings and being able to gather consistently together in a larger facility. Amen, somebody. Amen. And me, let me just say that again, in a larger facility. Amen. That that's our, that's our goal. But for now, we're going to gather responsibly. We do so outside. Uh, I do have to lay something before you before we dig into the word of God today. And, you know, um, th this comes by way of a, a bit of a repentance. Uh, Pastor Timmy and I had an elders meeting earlier this week and we were sharing and talking and uh, we both were deeply convicted by something specific that we felt it important to lay before you uh, and just in, in, in a way, repent to you. Last week when we gathered as a church, um, you know, one of the things that you, you may or may not know even what I'm talking about. If you don't know, praise God. If you do know, please accept this apology. Last week when we gathered, uh, before church started, uh, we had a, a DJ playing and he was playing music. And, um, you know, one of the ways we try to engage the community is play stuff that's relevant to to the neighborhood, stuff that they that they would understand, that they would know, stuff that's clean, 
without cursing, you know, stuff that, you know, has good content without being vulgar. And unfortunately, there were a few songs that were played um, that just weren't appropriate. And, you know, there was, it was a miscommunication. I take full responsibility. My wife ran to the DJ and said, turn that off. Pastor Timmy ran to the DJ and said, turn that off. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, what was played was played. And, you know, and those of you who are in this room, there, there is a difference between cultural relevant ministry and carnal ministry. There's a, there's a big difference, you know, and yes, we strive. In fact, one of our core convictions is cultural relevancy. We, we want people in the street to be able to engage and understand the church and be able to look in and don't see people that are stuffy, but people that they see on the train and in the streets and in the coffee shop. And we, we want to maintain that relevancy. I mean, I don't know if you heard it. The band was bumping real love. I mean, there's just nothing more relevant than that. But we have to be careful. I think you know, it's 1 Timothy 3.15 that says, this is the church of the living God, the pillar ground and the place of truth. And I never want to disrespect the church. I never want to dishonor the church. And so I do apologize. It was somewhere around Justin Bieber's yummy that I was like, this is, this is not appropriate. You know, we got, we got old saints here, you know, and, and, and some, you know, the, the young folk was was, you know, dancing and stuff. And I just, we just got to be careful. You know, we never want to disrespect or dishonor the church. Amen? Amen. All right, let's dig in. Luke chapter 23. Shout out to the good folks at Good People for sending me some merch. My boy Zoe sent me a t-shirt. I'm grateful. Thank you. All right, let's dig in. Verse 55. This may not make sense when I read it, but I think it, it, uh, it'll all come together. At least I pray it will come together. Luke 23, verse 55 says, The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, him and his, meaning Jesus. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested. You should underline that phrase. According to the commandments. We'll stop there. I'm going to preach today from our first, uh, our first, first week in Built Different. I'm going to preach from the topic entitled, We Cry Differently. We cry differently. Somebody in this room, if you could just say, we cry differently. differently. If you're online, if you could just type that in, we cry different. We deal with pain and loss just differently. Let's look to the Lord before we dig in. Uh, Father, as we open your word, um, Father, I want to express our deep need and desire to have you present. Father, you really don't need an invitation. You, you just, you just, you're there. You're, you're, you're everywhere. I love the way David said, if I ascend into the heavens, you're there. But if I make my bed in Sheol, even there, you are there. Father, there is not a place we can go in this world that you are not there. There is not a rock we can climb on or go under that you are not there. It's not a crevice, a, a place in a, a tunnel a, that we can hide from your presence. You are so massive. And so, Father, we, we're not praying to invite you into a place that you're not. We're praying that we would get to experience you today, experience you through your word and experience you through worship. And Father, may Jesus be promoted today. May he be heard. May he be seen. May he be felt as we talk about mourning and grief and loss, such a relevant topic for the season of life that many of us are in right now. It's in Christ's name we give all glory and all honor. Amen. We cry differently. There is an anonymous quote that says, give your child the gift of a childhood. And, and really underneath that quote, I, I think what the anonymous quoter is saying is that children need to be protected from the craziness of adulthood. That the children need to be protected from the craziness of life and, and the craziness of responsibilities. As a father, I intentionally want to take on all of the struggles uh, so that my children can be shielded from it. I, I want to teach them about struggles. I want to teach them about life. I, I want them to understand that these weights and that the responsibilities are going to be on their shoulders. But as children, I don't want them to have to worry about certain things. For, for example, they shouldn't have to worry about how bills are getting paid. 
Ch children don't have to worry about when the mortgage is due. Children don't have to worry about when food and how food gets on the table. In the 90s, Toys R Us used to have a slogan that said, I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. And really what they were saying was Ch children ha have almost a carefree life. I mean, I want you to zap back to when you were a child and just think about the fact that you had no bills and no responsibility and no debt to pay back and no student loans and, you know, you had no work responsibilities, that there was this carefreeness that we all had. And cars look great to kids, but not car notes. I'm just saying the degrees to get a degree to become a doctor and get your doctorate seems great as a child. But that loan repayment just hits differently because children can dream and children can have aspirations. But actually to work things out, I mean, it's just a hard responsibility. So as children, what we want to do is we want to protect them. My, my kids are are now. Um, uh, 16 or 15 and about to be 18, my oldest son said, I can't believe I'm even saying this. My oldest son is actually about to be 18. It, it is Will Smith that said that parenting is living in that tension of holding on and letting go. I think I'm at the point where I'm letting go more than I am actually holding on as he is preparing himself for college. But all through his life and all through my, my youngest son's life, I wanted to protect them from the craziness of life. But here's the reality. There is one area in life that you can't even protect children from, and that's pain and loss. You can protect them from paying bills, but you cannot protect them when someone in the family dies. In fact, I want you to think back to your first experience with grief and with pain and with loss. I bet you it was when you were a child. I don't know if you remember a family member passing away, maybe it was an auntie or an uncle or a mother or a father or a brother or a sister or a cousin, but we, we can all recall that moment we got introduced to grief. And I can promise you, for most of us, it wasn't when we were adults. As much as my parents tried to protect me, I remember the sting of an aunt passing away. I remember the sting of a grandfather or a grandmother passing away. And so you could protect your kids from a lot. But the sting of pain and death and loss and grief is not one of the areas. And so the question is, how do we cope with pain and loss when we're introduced to it at such a young age and have to deal with it all of our life? It's not, that, it's not like you get to graduate from pain and loss. It's not, it's not like you get to graduate from grief. You may be in a joyous season right now, but all of us will enter back in to that season of grief. And we can blame that on Genesis chapter three. You can blame death and sickness on Genesis chapter three. But the reality is when we do, if you have trusted in Jesus, when we do have grief, we deal differently with it now than we did before we knew Jesus. The title of this sermon is we cry different. But I need you to note that the title of the sermon is not we don't cry. Let, let me help you out. I want to take the myth off the table. This myth that being strong and mean, being that I'm built different means that I don't actually engage in my emotions. The devil is a liar. Not crying is not you being strong, it's you being numb. Not, not, not actually dealing with your emotions, not having it, an emotional response is not normal. You probably need therapy. You probably need counseling. And I don't mean that in a funny or a shady way. I'm dead serious when I say you got to enter into your emotions. Remember when Lazarus died yeah. and, and Jesus knew he was going to raise him. But still, the, the, this is Jesus that entered into a season of emotional turmoil we are human. Of course we cry. We, we are human. Of course we grieve. And the, and the question on the table today is how do we deal with it? How do we deal with our issues? When I was in seminary preparing for ministry, we had a class where we talked about two different types of grief. One of them was, I and mean, really it was all, the grief was surrounded around death. And we were talking about progressive death versus sudden death and which one is harder to deal with. But progressive meaning we saw it coming. Maybe the person was old and they, they were sick for a long time and we knew we prepared ourselves for their passing. I remember my grandmother passed Mount Sinai Hospital. She was old and we, we almost were prepared for her passing because she was sick for so long. 
Or, or maybe it was a young person or middle-aged person that was diagnosed with, 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 with a terminal illness and we watched them get sick and we prepared ourselves for their death. Or maybe it was sudden, right? Maybe, maybe it was you didn't expect it to happen. It was a car accident or something unexpected, a heart attack, a brain aneurysm. I, I don't know. It was something that the presence that that person brought to your life is no longer here in a moment. And in the class, in that seminary class, we sat and talked for two hours about which one of them is harder. One of them you have to care of as a pastor. You have to care for the, pa- for the family for a long time. And the other one, you have to help the family actually deal with the sudden pain of the absence of a loved one. And at the end of the class, we realize they're both hard. Neither one of them are easy because grief in and of itself is not easy. Sickness is not easy. Death is not easy. And so we arrive at a passage that I think will help us to deal with our pain and loss We arrive at a passage that will help us to realize how we are built differently. Now, quick disclaimer, I I, I am not speaking to you today as a professional. I am not a trained psychiatrist. I have spent no academic time actually working through uh, the impact of pain and loss. And so today I'd rather come to you as a pastor without cliches. You, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, that, those type of cliches where we say, you know, that they're in a better place, but that doesn't help me. Right. I'm, still, I'm still dealing. I'm still wrestling. I'm still grieving. So I, I need something a little bit deeper. I think today I want to help us to have an anchor, and I think we get an anchor in the scripture. Watch the, what's happening in this text. Verse 55 says, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed, talking about Jesus, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, meaning Jesus has died and they are now basically at his burial. It says, then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. Note note that the text says that these women are following after the dead body of Jesus. He's not alive. He's not walking. They are going to his burial. They found out where he was buried and they went and prepared spices and ointments. But I think it's something that we missed in the first two words of each verse. Verse 55 says, the women, not the woman. It says W, I don't know if this is in your Bible, W-O-M-E-N, not M-A-N, meaning there is more than one woman that's following along. The, the, the text also says in verse number 56, they, then they, meaning plural. That means there is a community of people that are grieving Together, And one of the ways that we are built differently as believers is when we hit a season of grief and pain, we should always be able to count on the body to be there for us. Well, one of the ways that we deal with grief and pain is that we don't do it alone. We do not deal with our hardships isolated. And the people of God have a place in our life when uh, critical moments of when we hit hardship. These women are not walking alone. These women are not preparing spices alone. These women are not going to the tomb alone. And one of the most dangerous things you can do when death and grief comes is walk isolated and walk alone. It's Proverbs chapter 18 that says he who who is isolated breaks out against all sound judgment. There's something so dangerous in being isolated, especially when you are dealing with hardship. Sometimes you just need somebody to talk to. So sometimes you you need somebody to cry with and you need somebody to pray with. And this may not be spiritual, but sometimes you need somebody to vent to even about God. I don't know if you've ever been there where you like you like David in the Psalms. God, where are you? God, God, you used to be near to me. You used to be close to me, but I just feel your absence. And, you know, it, it is in those seasons when we are in grief and pain that we need The body, the Bible says that these women are going to the tomb together and many of us are guilty of going to the tomb alone. If you were in the text, would you be going to the tomb with the body or would you be going alone? And I would argue that you need your sisters in a hard time. But brothers, you you might need the company of the boys in a hard time, but be careful to make sure that you don't just get company for company's sake. You actually get the right people around you when you're going through. Because I would argue that the only thing worse than being isolated 
when you are going through is going through in the company of fools. Yeah. Y'all remember the story of Job? Yeah. Job is 42 chapters of all conversation. If you're a talker and you like talking, you like conversation, read through the book of Job. It's just a bunch of conversations back and forth. The Bible tells you, I mean, it starts off talking about how Job loses everything, family, money. He is sick. And the Bible shows us that when Job loses everything, his three friends show up, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And when they show up, they do right in the beginning. They just sit. Because sometimes when I'm going through, I don't need you to counsel me. I just need you to be present. And that's one of the benefits we have in the body is sometimes when you are going through, the body knows how to just show up and be present. These these three friends all showed up and they did right in the beginning. They showed up and they they shut up. But somewhere along the line, they begin to talk. And their speech messed them up. Their speech betrayed them because when they talked, we realized they were not there to comfort Job. They were there to make sense of what Job was going through. Let me help you. You can't make sense of what God is doing. That sometimes when he takes people from our life, you don't understand why he did it. And the last thing I need for you to do is to tell me why he did it. Let me put Bible here real quick. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is what God says to us. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are the many ways higher, so are my many ways higher than your ways, and my many thoughts are higher than your thoughts. When I am going through, I do not need the body to explain to me why I am going through. And plus, we show up and we say stuff like, you know, heaven gained another angel. That's stupid. I mean, first of all, where is that in the Bible that humans die and become angels? That, that ain't nowhere in Scripture, but we say stuff like that. And we think that that helps us and we think that that helps the person that is going through. And it is dangerous for me to be isolated, but it is also dangerous for me to be around people that only want to talk in these tech. In this text, these women aren't talking. Can I help you? There's not a conversation happening in verse 55 or verse 56. They're just going through life and grieving together. They are mourning together together because they realize that when I am isolated in a time of grief, I am at my most vulnerable state. When when I'm I'm isolated in a time of grief, it is easier for the enemy to speak lies to me. It is easier for the devil to trick me because I can't make the best decisions when I'm going through. So you just need people to be around you, 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 you need people to be around so that the devil doesn't pull you away from God. Speaking of pulling away from God, watch what these women do so we can see how else we are built different. It says, verse 55, it says, The women who had come with him from Galilee followed him and saw the tomb and saw how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and ointments. When I first read this, I'm in my mind, I'm going, why are y'all following after the dead body of Jesus? Why, why are you going to the tomb? Why are you preparing, you know, with the ointment to make sure that, the, you know, they didn't have embalming fluid? Why, why, are you, why are you still present for Jesus? Then it dawned on me that these women did not just want to be in the presence of God when he was alive, but they remained close to him even in a state of grieving. In other words, they didn't just remain close to him when he was alive and performing miracles and preaching and and people were getting saved and people were getting healed, but they actually wanted to be close to him even in a hard time, even in the time of his death. They wanted to be close to him in life and in death. And this is interesting to me because these women, after they hit a season of grief, they didn't go back to doing what they were doing. They didn't go back to their old life. These women did not walk away from the faith. These women that were faithful to Jesus when he was alive did not denounce him when he died. And let's be clear, there were a few disciples that tried that. Check out Peter in John chapter 1. The Bible says that Peter, after Jesus died, went fishing. And many many commentators will say that that Peter went fishing because he was really going back to his old way of life and giving up the mission until Jesus had to check him and put him back on mission. These women wanted to remain close to Jesus in life 
and in death. And I'll often say this, that sickness and death and grief have a way of doing two things. Either pulling you closer to Jesus or pushing you away. I'm going to help you. You never stay in the middle. You, you never stay stagnant. When you hit grief and you hit hardship, you never stay where you were spiritually. Either you press into him and learn that he actually is a comforter. Or you pull away from him because you are mad and somebody that's piped on right now, you're, you're on the latter end of that. You're pulling away from God. You've seen sickness and death around you throughout the last year. Maybe it was a family member that contracted COVID and passed away. And our church has certainly gone through our set of grief. And maybe that's you where you're pulling away from God. Let me encourage you today. Don't pull away from him. Be like these women and press into him even in a state of grief. Because here's the reality. If we're not careful If we're not careful, if we don't press into Jesus during our time of grief, we always find other ways to cope with our issues. I'm going to set you free today. There are some people that hit a season of grief and went to drugs because they were trying to cope with their issues. There are some people that hit a season of grief and start to abuse alcohol. And start to lose their mind and start to go left and give up on life. And we all deal with grief differently. But can I suggest to you that one of the ways that you prove that I am built differently is that when I go through grief, I press into Jesus. Not pull away from anybody in here ever gone through grief and you found yourself pulling away. You you found yourself drifting away. It is a dangerous season. It is a dangerous season to drift away from him in the midst of of brokenness. Only Jesus can fix our brokenness. We know that we are built differently when we walk through the hardship of life with the body. We, we, we know that we are built differently, that when, when we go through hardship, we don't pull away from Jesus, but we do like these women and they just continued on with what they were doing. What, what, what did we do before? Oh, let's go prepare the body. Let's stay close to Jesus. Let's follow along the tomb. I, I love this. The women were so quick to get it. The men missed it. Disciples, I mean, they they literally are fishing right now. These women are like, nah, I'm staying close to Jesus. Don't drift, but stay close. There's something else in the text I think is important. Forgive me, y'all, those in in this room, and, and forgive me, those of you who are piped on. This just may not be spiritually deep, but I think it's important for you to hear it. I think it's important for you to see this. It says here in verse 56, They returned and prepared spices and ointments. Don't miss this. On the Sabbath, they rested. I mean, we miss that, right? We're all in, oh, they're following and and they're preparing the body. We're thinking that, but we miss the fact that they also took time to rest. That they also took time to realize that grief is not just emotional and mental but it has a physical component to it. Can can, can anybody testify to the fact that when you were in a season of grief, it did not just hit you emotionally. It did not just hit you mentally, but it actually, bless you, it actually dealt with you physically. Don't over-spiritualize your trauma. I'm I'm just telling you, the, the body can take a toll in the midst of grief. The body can get messed up in the midst of grief. I didn't know I was going to go here, but I remember in 2019 when our beloved Elijah passed away. I remember I was in Texas. It was a Friday and Ed and Tisha called. And that was, I mean, one of the worst calls I've ever had to get. I remember that call. And I remember when we, my, Ty and I were in the lobby. I had to preach that Sunday at a church in Texas, but I couldn't do it. I just, I just had to be back with the body. And so and I had to be back with the family. And so I jumped on a flight on Saturday morning, my family and I, and we went back home. I got out of LaGuardia Airport, rented a car because I don't own a car, jumped down to Jersey, sat with the family uh, for most of the night, jumped back in the car, drove back to Brooklyn, mentally wrote a sermon because I had nothing prepared for that Sunday, mentally wrote a sermon, got back here on Sunday morning at the building and preached three services. What I did not tell you was that in between each service, I was physically messed up. 
I was in my office throwing up. Miss Carol taking out bags of throw up. Ashton sitting here going, yo, you all, you all right? You going to make it through the next service? I realized that my emotional response to grief was not just mental, but it was physical. And you, you, you have no clue how much that your grief is weighing on you physically. Some of you don't even, aren't even aware of it, that you've hit a season of grief and you went, you went to alcohol and you gained 50 pounds. That is what happens in grief. And I told y'all this wasn't going to be deep. But the reality is some of you, some of the most spiritual things you can do in the midst of grief, watch this, is get rest. These women, they did what they were supposed to do. And the Bible says on the Sabbath, they rested. Some of those spiritually things you can do in the midst of grief is take a nap, eat healthy, read a book, go for a walk, go shopping on a budget, get your hair done. They, they, because what happens is in grief, we tend to lose ourselves. And we let ourselves go, but don't let yourself go. The Bible says that these women had wisdom enough to do the spiritual things, but also physically they took time to rest because God gave you one body and you should take care of it. You should take care of yourself. Don't, don't just note the fact that these women on the Sabbath, the Bible says on the Sabbath, they rested. But the rest of the verse says, according to the commandments. God, like, don't miss this. They, they did not allow their grief to cause them to disobey God's commandments. They, they did not allow their hardship to cause them to backslide and go backwards and disrespect God. The Bible just says that on Sabbath they rested according to the commandments that they did not allow. They refused to allow the hardship and the grief of life to make them go back on their commitment to God. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me when I tell you grief is not a license to sin. See, many of us go into a life, a, a, a cycle of, of disobedience to God, and we always point it back to grief. And we were able to say, when my father passed away, I don't know what happened, but, you know, I, I just gave up. I just, I just gave up my spiritual walk. I just, I gave up on God, but these women aren't giving up. They're remaining faithful to the Sabbath, that they are resting. These women are committed to the commandments of God. Don't allow your hardship and your go through and your grief to be a license for you to do you. And I know I'm talking to somebody I, I, I know, I know, I can, I can feel, I can sense it that there is somebody on the other, other end of that camera that is in the midst of hardship and your excuse for going out and doing you is because of grief. But the reality is get help, get the body around you, make sure that you are committed to God, get therapy, get all the things that you need, but don't give up on God because can't nobody hold you like God. Don't, 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 don't get, don't go into a lifestyle of sin, but you know, Throughout this entire sermon, I, I realize that when I talk about grief, I am always tying it to death. I'm always tying grief to sickness. But you know that, that there is a, gr a grief, a type of grief that can show up in your life that has nothing to do with a funeral. I I'm talking about grief that comes from a failed relationship. Some of you are grieving right now that you are not in that relationship anymore. Even let me go deeper. Maybe it's a marriage, a, a marriage that was broken and you were grieved and you are hurt over. Grief doesn't just show up at death. Grief can also show up in a failed business. Do you know how many businesses failed through the last year? Do you know how many people got laid off over the last year? Do you know how many entrepreneurs had to close the books over the last year? That has a way of bringing, uh, bringing up all types of grief. Or, or maybe, may, maybe your grief is showing up, and I've seen this one a lot. This one is common, in infertility. There, there is a lot of, do you know how many people are grieved over the fact that they are trying to have a baby over and over, and then they're, they're going to the doctor, and, 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 and they're, they're, trying, they're just trying to figure this thing out. That thing has a way of bringing grief that most of us don't understand. But I think how if you understand how we cope with it, I think the principles are still the same. No matter the source of grief, you need the body. 
No matter the source of grief, you need to draw closer to Jesus, not away from him. No matter the source of grief, you need to make sure that you are taking care of yourself physically. No matter the source, source of grief, you can't allow it to be an excuse for you to be disobedient to God as believers. We just go through life differently. Let me put a little bit more Bible here. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. We do not grieve as others grieve with no hope. B, I'm just built different. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I walk differently. I, I, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else. I just got a sure anchor. I got a source. I have a comforter. I have something that nobody else has, and that's somebody that's willing to hear all of my issues, and that is the person in the work of Jesus Christ. I don't know who it is out there that you're dealing with grief right now. You're dealing with hardship right now. It might be somebody in this room. It might be somebody in the tech room right now. You thought you just showed up to serve today and to, 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 to you know, to punch pro presenter or whatever it is y'all use. You thought you just showed up to sing and do sound and lights. Maybe it's you on the other end of this camera. You, you, you thought you just logged on today just because you went to check off the list. I went to church. I did virtual church today. But, but you've actually logged on so that you can deal with your grief. We've put it off for so long because the reality is some of us are dealing with grief over the last year, but then there is another person that's dealing with grief from a child. You've never got over it. You've never dealt with it. And you're trying to figure out why it is that you're so snippy with people. You can't have relationships and friendships because everybody around you, it all, it's just a trigger for you. But the reality is you're probably dealing with grief and you, you need the comforter. You need the body. You need commitment to Jesus. It's not deep, but you need to rest. The Bible says that these women followed the body. They didn't only follow the body, but they prepared ointments and spices to embalm the body. The Bible says that these women rested on the Sabbath. And these women were faithful to God. But all the while, they're in the community of other grievers. Let me pray for you today. I know this was short and I know you're probably like, I just needed more today. Nah, you need to deal with that grief. Father, I pray for everybody in this room. I know that there's somebody that's dealing with hardship. Father, I know that there's somebody that's dealing with pain. And The pandemic has had a way, God, of helping us to, in an unhealthy way, normalize grief. N normalize sickness and normalize death. It's become common. Oh, she, oh she, she got the virus. Oh, he's on the ventilator. It's just become so normal. But Father, would you help us to understand this is all the re direct results of Genesis 3 and we look forward to Revelation 21 where there is no more sickness. But while we are here, help us to cope with our issues and our, and, our, and, and, and our grief and our pain and our loss. I don't want to minimize, Lord, anybody's pain. We're dealing with deep stuff, deep trauma, deep go through. And it's, it's consistent. It's a, it's a weight. It's a burden. It's a yoke. But I, I feel like the disciples today where Peter says we were burdened beyond our strength. But the beauty in us being burdened beyond our strength is that you show up and you bear the load. The cliche that he won't put more on us, on our, on us than we can bear in biblical. No, you, you burden us beyond our strength. You, you get us to the point where we can't handle it alone. Because that births dependency on you. And so, Father, I, I just I want to pray for that person today that has been dealing and suffering in silence and they haven't told anybody that they are that they are dealing with the issues that they are dealing with. Father, help them to realize that if they've trusted in you, they're built different. That they got an anchor, that they got a source. 
that nobody else has. And Father, I pray, oh God, that we don't just realize we have a source today, but that today we actually tap into it and that you comfort us the way that nobody else can comfort us. It's in the matchless name of your son and our king, Jesus Christ. Amen.